A lot of them are trying to change their race into Asian people, mainly by listening to these things called subliminals, which are like these YouTube videos with lo-fi music and pictures of East Asian people. Jerry, what is one thought you have about this, uh, this trend going on? It's true. Every night I put on lo-fi, chill, hip-hop beats to study to, to maintain my chinkiness at night. Yeah. <laughs> Every night. It's part of my skincare routine. Welcome to the Politically Asian Podcast. We're two Asian American comedians talking about politics and the Asian American community in hopes of getting more Asians to talk about politics. We are coming at you live from Brooklyn, New York. My name is Jerry Lim. My pronouns are they, them. And you can find me across the internet at Jerryaki. That's G-E-R-R-I-E-Y-A-K-I. And my co-host... Hey, my name is Aaron Yin. My pronouns are he, him, and you can find me on social media at Aaron Flarin. That's A-A-R-O-N-F-L-A-R-I-N. Today, we're going to start off our episode with our fortune cookie fortune shout out. So every week we read fortunes for our supporters who donate to support us at buymeacoffee.com slash political Asian. We try to spice it up by having ChatGBT do a couple of special prompt fortunes. And then we interpret it with a politically Asian twist. So this week, our donor is Carolyn. Yay! Yay. Thank Thanks, you, Carolyn. Too, Carolyn. Cool. All right, Carolyn. So your fortune for this week is... The universe conspires to bring us together. Embrace intersectionality, for in unity, we find our true strength. All right. Well, Jerry, what's one thought you had about this fortune? What in the A24 past lives? I like the energy. <laughs> uh, you know, the more the merrier. I feel like this is such a good thing to keep in mind when you have that coworker you hate, but you guys are like on the same level um, when you're talking about like organizational hierarchy. That always helps me keep calm and cool headed and just try to like. Think about, okay, this person is not the enemy. They are my ally, and I should be trying to at least get along with them to some degree um, and find something else we can hate together. Uh, yeah, that's kind of where I walk away with that. What about you? Mm, yeah. I feel like that first line, I almost feel the opposite, right? I feel like there are many instances where the universe conspires to split people up, right? Like, like or, or <laughs> in our day-to-day -day life, there are, it's, maybe it's not, the universe but there are many people you know your bosses organizations just people you know that you know realize that if you you are stronger together and they do whatever they can to pit you all against each other so i feel like you know that's where the second part of the message comes in where it's like embrace intersectionality just kind of see through all the ways that they're trying to divide you um and and, and so that you don't have to fight each other instead of the main thing yeah, that, that's my main takeaway, too. I guess, like, on a day-to-day -day level, um, you know, like, I work in sales, and there's, like, multiple levels, like, level one and level two, and I think one um, very easy way to actually fight each other is just to, for the level ones and level twos to fight each other. But mm -hmm. in reality, we both all are still in the same overall category of not management, so it's yeah. like, guys, we got to, well, you know, just, just focus, focus, you know, reset. <laughs> so that, that's what I think of when I read this fortune. Yeah. But, yeah, for Carolyn... Uh, you know, I'm not sure if you're struggling with anything at work or um, if you do any organizing and you're trying to bring people together. But it's really, really important to just try to find the, I want to say, bare minimum that brings you all together. Otherwise, there are so many things that can be said to split you all apart. That's deep. That's deep. Yeah, I think the bare minimum really does work. Like we're all tenants or we're all workers. Oh. Or we're yeah. all blank. It, it really, really helps because it, you, you kind of lose sight of that sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I feel like talking about work is a great segue into our next segment, Practice What You Preach. So if you're new to the pod, we, you know, we talk a lot about politics, but it's also important to do things. So each week we share one thing we did related to politics and or organizing. And this week I shall go first. Uh, so if you haven't been keeping up, 
work has been hell for me. I work in an office. I work a tech job. Boo, tomato, tomato. And uh, lately work has been really, it's been a lot of work. I'm not used to focusing for eight hours straight. <laughs> That's very hard for me, even with my medication. Um, and our team has been shrinking and shrinking, but uh, we finally got management to agree to at least performance reviews at the end of August slash beginning of September. Um, and what's been super helpful is that other departments have also begun to complain. So it's not just us because it kind of looks bad if it's just, you know, you guys, if it's just like one group oh, yeah. of people who's complaining. But if it's like other departments, it starts to look really bad um, for, for management, not for us. But yeah. And uh, yeah, um, more importantly, we've been a little bit more in control of the workflow, just bullying works, threats work, because we threatened to just completely stop working if people didn't get their shit together. So yeah, that's that's kind of where we're at, at the office right now. Okay, yeah, that's pretty good. You kind of started a little bit of the, the fire, right? So is everyone else complaining because they saw you complaining? Um, Sort of, and I think it's also just everyone's a little disgruntled especially because mm. of linkedin i never thought linkedin would actually come in handy like be on our side but this time it has because some people have been putting their promotions on linkedin and <laughs> we were told that no one was getting promoted Ooh. so we're a lot of people are just kind of like well what are the metrics for why this person got promoted and the rest of us didn't we didn't even get raises and you know inflation's been crazy this year so if you're not making a raise or even getting like a cost of living adjustment you're like losing money hmm i see okay gotcha gotcha cool well that's good and the workload's lower i mean this all sounds really good right you just hope it kind of lasts uh because you mentioned august right august is where they start doing performance reviews yeah, the end of the end of August, uh, beginning of September. Um, hopefully, we'll begin doing something. I guess my biggest fear is we do bad at the performance reviews. Mm, yeah. <laughs> but I, I don't think that'll be the case. What's the point of the, like? What's the point of having them? Because isn't that a way for management to critique you for not doing enough? Um. Yeah, I would be very surprised if they found a way to complain about us mostly because we don't have a manager right now we only have like a substitute teacher mm, kind I of see. situation yeah. so it's it's kind of hard to really pinpoint what we're doing um and all they can see is our output which is mm. you know a lot yeah. so yeah. yeah i guess they could find a way to shit on us but we are literally a skeleton crew right now so if we you know get they can't really afford to fire us <laughs> oh, so, so it's more to like, just to understand this, it's more as a a good thing so that they see you're doing a lot of work and give you a raise? Yeah, I would, I'm, I think they're going to be pressed to find a reason not to give us a raise, really. Because like, oh, I think okay, everyone okay. has like, you know, done, what's that called? Pulled their weight. Mm, gotcha. Yeah. Well, that's exciting. Yeah, I guess it, hopefully, it, it seems like <laughs> y'all won or did something, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think if, you know, things go further south, we're one bad day away from unionizing, like, seriously. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, what about you? Um, yeah, I think over the past two weeks, um, one thing I did was, you know, the group I'm with, Youth Against Displacement, we went to this art exhibit by this guy named Arlen Huang. Arlen Huang is a member of this old art group called Godzilla. And they're relevant because they were supposed to have an exhibit in MoCA, but they withdrew their exhibit from MoCA, the Museum of Chinese in America, because this museum, you know, took money from the city as part of the city's plan to build that jail in Chinatown. The reason we went there is actually kind of related to the fortune for Carolyn. So we were trying to essentially like network and bond with more of the artist groups in New York City. Because we have worked with them, but yo, know, like my thing about artists, and if you're a lar and you're an artist. Please confirm or deny. But my own opinion of artists is that they don't really do a lot of actual organizing. Like they mm. they count the designing of like an exhibit or like an art piece as as organizing itself. When I, and I don't think of that as that. Like it's um it's more of like a support role instead of like being you know in front of something or leading something, yeah. right? And I think yeah. a lot of artists that we know 
have that mentality like oh let me know what kind of thing i can draw to support you all and i'm like we don't need the drawings we need you as a person <laughs> you know like i think there's we need there's, the body we need the body yeah and so i think um you know the reason we went there was to just say hi you know kind of mingle some more and also try to get them to take up some actual initiative on their own for a broader fight against like displacement in chinatown and lower east side Oh, really cool. Did you did you get like any kind of commitments? Are they going to come out to the picket line? I mean, it's not just about the picket line. The picket line is just like one small thing, but it's like the mm -hmm. most visible one. Right. But it's like, yeah, we're trying to meet with them next week. We also have a meeting with um, like Welcome to Chinatown separately just to talk about like the small business angle. Like what can small businesses actually do to fight against displacement and, you know, luxury real estate in Chinatown? Like what are they comfortable doing? How can they be like an active participant instead of just like a, you know, bystander or someone who's like, I'm not a leader. I can support you a tiny bit, but I'm, I'm not that person. Mm. I think that's like the biggest mindset that's really hard to change. Oh, that's interesting. I, I guess like I've never even thought about like the mindset that would be a challenge or like the prevalent yeah, mindset. Yeah, a lot of people like really see themselves as like support roles and it's like, that's not helpful at all. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Interesting. Well, Keep us updated on that and like how, you know, um, what happens next week. Yeah. Like, I think it's, it's really a good example of just, you got to reach out to people and try to get some threads together and then try to get them to have like self-determination, I guess is, is mm. what the word is, but yeah. Well, cool. Uh, in the meantime, let's move on to the meat of the episode. So before we talk about this week in Asian American politics, we first do want to acknowledge all of the wildfires happening currently in Maui. It's really bad. I think as of this recording right now, there's at least 100 deaths, but that's very, very likely underreported given the state of things. Uh, we will be donating. We hope you all can donate as well. There are a few different funds. I think one of the ones that we've seen the most is called Maui Strong. So if you just Google Maui Strong, you'll see it. Uh, if you're thinking about going to Hawaii, don't go to Hawaii. Definitely don't do that ever, <laughs> like, in general. Uh, that's that's a summary of it. We have nothing to really, like, say besides that. So that that's why we just want to acknowledge it but not, you know, talk about it in depth because there's not – in my mind, like, there's not as much to say right now besides it's very bad. Don't go to Hawaii as a tourist. That's all I, that's all I got to say. Yeah, that sums it up. We'll put the link to the GoFundMe and other donations in the episode description and things like that. Yeah, but TLDR, I guess a quick way is just Google Maui Strong or just donate, you know, Google how do I donate to Maui? And there's there's a ton <laughs> of different things going on. But, yeah, let's move on to the first uh, piece of news. So this one I thought was really fun. Uh, the article itself is titled Inside the Online World of People Who Think They Can Change Their Race. And specifically, a lot of them are trying to change their race into Asian people, specifically East Asian people, I'd say, dare I say, Korean and Japanese, uh, <laughs> mainly by listening to these things called subliminals, which are like these YouTube videos with lo-fi music and pictures of East Asian people. Jerry, what is one thought you have about this uh, this trend going on? It's true. Every night I put on lo-fi, chill, hip-hop beats to study to, to maintain my chinkiness at night. Yeah. Every night. <laughs> yeah. It's part of my skincare routine. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, we just transform into white people. You know? <laughs> yeah. Just yeah. slowly and slowly. <laughs> yeah. It's it's now the 10-step Korean skincare routine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the last one is the subliminal. Yo, it's, it's really wild. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was like, maybe it's time to plug plug the podcast as a subliminal, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, we should actually put that on the YouTube account. I'm, yeah. I'm dead. We should do that. Yo, open up our TikTok, Politically Asian Podcast. I promise you, if you listen to this, you'll get the... Um, hold on, let me read what they actually want. I promise you, if you listen to this, you will get the flat nasal root, flat glabella, and less produced, pronounced nose bridge that you all want. <laughs> Bro, who? I cannot believe there are people out there who actually want a low nose bridge. Like, yeah. love my face, but finding sunglasses and eyeglasses have been honestly a curse. Like, yeah, it's man. not worth it, man. <laughs> yep. Yeah. <laughs> I, it was that. And then I was also like, yo, maybe this is also a really good time to cash in. Like, you, you, you know, I could see myself like, you know, if I had to start a business, I would sell custom subliminals 
Like, this is a Ooh. personalized video for you to get the Asian look that you want. <laughs> I mean, why don't we cash in? What yeah. are we doing with the podcast? Let's, yeah. let's just do this. Let's make a lo-fi channel, man. Yeah. It literally is like, it's like modern day, like ASMR, but without, it's like just words on a screen and said, it's like, you will look East Asian. You will look like Jenny from Blackpink. It's fucking weird. <laughs> Also, it's just a side note. It is wild to, to hear about the chokehold lo-fi music has on like Asian American culture. Yeah, it's it's they're now producing. I mean, they're essentially labeling it as like medicine now, right? Yeah, it's, it's wild. Yeah, um, I think it just fits into a broader trend of everyone clout chasing to be East Asian. Um, you know, because a majority of these people, like they're not listening to subliminals to transform into like black people or Hispanic people. It's like purely East Asian, almost purely yeah. Korean. Yeah, that's interesting. I don't, oh, I don't know. It's just interesting to see like, what do they think like the country of like Korea does? You know, like do, do they like? They do what I you do. <laughs> they listen to it at night each night, <laughs> just to right, maintain right. anime theme songs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe they listen to a, sh a slightly shorter clip because you know they they don't. Oh right, because we already have it, so that we, yeah. we we don't need to maintain it yeah, as hard. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, but for people who like just if people YouTube um like Korean subliminals. No, don't. Are we gonna tell people oh, so no, they can no, no, find no. it? Oh yeah, wait, wait. Don't give them more views. That's true. Just right, trust us. Right. Yeah. Right, anyway, right. But dude, the videos are weird, man. Like what I was saying earlier, it's like. It's there was one video that was really famous. It was like a three minute video of a female K pop star. I don't know who it is, but it's just her picture. And then it says the words Mongoloid skull on it. Bro, <laughs> like, bro just call me the slur. <laughs> like, this, is, this is literally like a hate crime music video or something. <laughs> I'm scared. Like, if I were that K pop artist, I would be scared for my yeah. life. But it's Just so Mongoloid weird. Skull. Yeah, Wait, cause... I want a shirt that says that. Yeah. Because <laughs> the idea is you have a video and then the words on it are the physical features that you want. And so, like, you know, very common ones that are general, like, I want to be taller or prettier, right? But this subset is like very, like, Flat nasal root, mongoloid skull, creaseless eyelids. It's very like, oh, this is like race science for sure. Oh my god. I wish, okay, ah. part of me, I'm gonna get canceled for this, but part of me kind of wish this worked because then I would just, this is just like hormone replacement therapy for free. Uh. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. I don't need to pay this, for top surgery. Uh, I just listen to this over and over again. Yeah, you will have yeah. a flat chest. You will have yeah. a flat chest. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> <laughs> that's what they do <laughs> oh uh, man yeah uh i mean the formal term for the group now is race change to another rcta which i also think is good right because so many of the people used to use like transracial which is normally for adoptees right and there's always beef about that oh right yeah 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 every single time people use that it's like no this is already a term for you know <laughs> yeah different someone races adopting each other or someone already has this term <laughs> you <Yeah>. can't use it <laughs> literally yeah <laughs> But yeah, it's, um, I, I mean, I didn't know about this at all, but like there are some accounts that have like 300 K 400 K followers and views per video. And I'm like, Whoa, 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 Whoa. Okay. Dude. Like, can you imagine being like a YouTube account and you, you get like AdSense revenue from, from stuff like this? That's what I'm saying. We got to cash in. We yeah. <laughs> what are we doing? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was, uh, this this piece is honestly just a wild ride from start to finish. There's like a quote in here from, um, I'm not sure if it's the same person that was mentioned in the beginning, which was a 15 year old high schooler who was born in Ukraine and now lives in Maryland, but goes by a Japanese name despite not being Japanese. Um, oh yeah. I don't know if this is from that person, but there's like a quote in here that says, we only live once. So I think we should do everything we want to do in life, even if others think it's not okay or you can't achieve it, which is wild to me because it's like, oh, well, people say this is racist, but uh, YOLO. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> literally. Oh, we'll blame Drake for this one. Yeah. <laughs> no, I blame Ollie London for all of this. Oh, Are you kidding yeah, me? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, this, this is like a good meme. It's like that community meme where it's like, I can excuse racism, but I draw the line at hurting animals or something. Yeah, yeah. It's like, uh, it's like uh, oh yeah, I can excuse racism, but I draw the line at... You you know you telling me not to make these videos. <laughs> I guess these videos are pretty racist, actually. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. 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 Dude. I mean, a lot of it does feel like 
uh, mainly teenagers who are already very susceptible um, mm. to like peer pressure now just trying to ride the train of east right because like the people that they're interviewing are actually like they're like teenagers i know but i just love the peer pressure this idea of like the peer pressure to be asian you better be fucking you better become asian or else yeah (laughs) yo it's i was thinking the same thing like stand-up comedy in like 10 years or so is gonna be kind of funny you're gonna have all these white comedians being like when i grew up i really wanted to be asian <laughs> instead of like you know like asian comedians right now like i really wanted to be white when i was a kid mm, i don't know john mulaney kind of has a bit where people called him a chink and i'm oh, just like i don't true. think you can say that man <laughs> yeah that is true that is true that is true uh but yeah, overall i think it's it's one of the more I was going to say one of the more extreme versions of people really wanting to ride the Korean wave, but I feel like getting surgery is the most extreme. This is a close second, though, for primarily minors. <laughs> for people who live in America and can't yeah. afford health yeah. care. <laughs> All right, this is, this is my last hot take on this. There should be a mutual aid organization that pairs Asian elders with, like, you know, an RCTA person, uh, one of these people who wants to transition races, I will call you Asian if you take a knife for an Asian elder. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, all right, fine. Exactly. <laughs> Yo, and, and just for fun, you know, on the same topic of cashing in, occasionally we'll, we'll hire like a fake hitman to like <laughs> look at both of the people and be like, oh, I can't tell which Asian to beat up or something. <laughs> and then Ooh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The person will be like, oh my God, it's working. It's working. <laughs> Oh, that could be like a startup idea. Like we'll hire we'll hire a, a racist to come and beat you up, and yeah, if they beat pretend. you up, that means you know that yeah. means they think you're Asian. Yeah, yeah, just a little little fake stunt right there. Yeah, oh, yeah. the cash potential right here. Also, might mm-hmm. make a fun movie. But that's pretty funny. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, moving on to our next topic, we are talking about you know we talked about white people who want to be Asian. Now we are talking about Asian people who want to be white. We're talking Uh about two Asian Republicans, (laughs) uh, Nikki Haley and Vivek. Vivek? Vivek? Vivek. Okay. We are talking about Nikki Haley and Vivek Ramaswamy, who are both running for president uh, on the Republican ticket and just how they've handled being on the campaign trail. So, for example, uh, in regards to religion, Ramaswamy is Hindu and he actually talks about it. Haley is a Christian. Um, Ramaswamy talks about race while Haley talks about quote overcoming race, which is interesting. And then this is not a comparison because I don't know what Haley does, but Ramaswamy calls himself a quote non white nationalist. Mm, Aaron, I'm going to leave it there. What do you think yeah. about all this? <laughs> yeah, I think overall it's a really good time just because we actually have. Not one, but, you know, two Asian people now, because I know when Andrew Yang ran, everyone only had him. But now we have two people who I feel like are on opposite sides of the spectrum. So Vivek, like you mentioned, non-white nationalist, he's very proud to be Hindu and, like, proud to be Indian. Mm. And Nikki Haley is on the opposite end where she's like, I don't see race. I, you know, I go by Nikki now. I'm also Christian now. So it's like, I feel like it's like every person can kind of map themselves out on a spectrum between Nikki and Vivek in terms of identity. So, okay. so that I think that's like the fun thing about having two of them. What do you think? Oh, uh, that's a good way to put it. I was just saying, like, it's good to have some Asian clown representation. Though I, do, yeah, I, I agree with you though. That's that's an interesting take. I never, I, for some reason, it just didn't register that there were two of them, and my brain was only seeing them as like <laughs> one. <There> was- <laughs> One giant clown doing oh like God. the Vegeta Goku like fusion dance. <laughs> you were monolithing them. Oh yeah, you know. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, it's um, uh, I think it's really interesting. I was like, you know, my my first thought was like, I would love to just see them debate each other, which will, will happen, right? I'm sure there's gonna be one part about how they they'll kind of make jabs at each other and call each other like untrustworthy because of how they show or hide their religion. Like Nikki's going to be like, don't trust this Hindu guy who has many gods. <laughs> and then Vivek's going to be like, how can you trust a, a woman, like an Indian woman who's trying to be white and calling herself Nikki? And I, <laughs> they're just going to be slinging at each I can, I can see that happening. 
Oh, that's, yeah. I, you know, I kind of hope they both make it to that level of the campaign now instead of just, like, dropping out. Because there was, like, when the article was saying that they're still only polling in the single digits, which yeah. I find very hard to believe because I feel like I see Ramaswamy, like, everywhere. Yeah. No, it, it, maybe it's because we're covering him more. Oh, <laughs> uh, that's fair. <laughs> yeah. But overall, it's... <sighs> It's really <laughs> when I, when I read about both of them, I just thought about that meme. Uh, you know, normally it's like it's like gay son or thought daughter, but this one's non-white nationalist son or I don't see Ray's daughter. <laughs> <laughs> just, the two genders. It's so funny. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I I think besides that, you know, it. I think it also speaks to their age because Nikki. Uh, well, not just their age, but like what time they went into politics because Nikki went into politics in the 90 when it was really bad to be non-white and then vivek's kind of riding the wave of like you know indian people who are more popular mainly in tech but also like pop culture a little bit too okay so he's like yeah i'm i'm rocking the indian american thing yeah well, it's interesting you mentioned tech because the article was talking about how his brand of politics is quote sort of mainstream for folks coming out of silicon valley and that's i was like kind of alarmed by that because i know one of the things that he <laughs> thinks is like everyone should have an ar-15 and i'm yeah. just like i find it very hard to believe that even like you know you're telling me that all the software engineers at facebook think we should have an ar-15 yeah where they all look up to the vague yeah <laughs> like, you know, yeah uh yeah that's so funny Dude, I mean, the funniest thing like we talked about with Vivek is he's also really into Eminem. Yeah. Yeah, and he he really loves rapping Eminem's "Lose Yourself" all the time. But it's just like, that dude. one song. <laughs> <laughs> it's just that one song. Yeah. It's just that, it's like you got one karaoke song and that's it. Yeah. Well, it's funny because he came up with this whole alter ego like Vivek, uh, yeah. just because of his one impression of Eminem. But I was like, dude, Vivek's just trying to live out every brown boy's dream of becoming a rapper. That's yeah, that's but, what but, it but really by being is. a politician, come on, there yeah. are better ways <laughs> yeah. to do this. He took the long route. He took the really long route. Yeah, it's, you know, we were talking about the other week. We were talking about like bullying legacies at Harvard. I hope y'all should have bullied him. Y'all should have bullied Ramaswamy harder at Harvard. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh. That's also a good point. I feel like if Vivek and Nikki become mainstream, then they could also, like, uh, their names could also be used, like, Karens, mm. or for respected people, right? Like, oh, like, if you're an Indian person really trying to be white, you can be like, okay, Nikki Haley. Ooh. Or, if, <laughs> or if you're, like, I, I don't I don't really know how to describe Vivek. He's, like, really proud to be Indian and Hindu, but also really trying to warp himself to be favorable towards Christians. Yeah, um, I, I, you can. I don't know how he's gonna get away with that one. Yeah, like, that's a really uphill battle. It's it's not even uphill. It's more like a straight line up. You know, it's vertical. Yeah. It's vertical. Yeah. <laughs> he he's climbing. Um, oh, there's that really famous uh cliff that's like it's called Ayers Rock. Maybe it's yeah, like it's in like Australia. Pure, yeah, it's a pure vertical. It's like a plateau. Like, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's like straight up. Yeah. Yeah, and then like yeah. Nikki, Nikki Haley, like when she announced that she was gonna run, she she like started her announcement with something like "not black, not white, I was different," and it's just like imagine um, announcing you're running for president with like diaspora poetry. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. That was like the one time she tr like sort of cashes in on the fact right. that she's not like that's the fact that she's Asian, but other than that, it's very much like. I don't see race at all, you know? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. What's the opposite of 2020? That's Nikki when it comes to race, you know? Like, <laughs> uh, yeah, like, yeah, pure, pure blindness. But, yeah, I... What do you think... Okay, my, my maybe, like, parting thought or fun question is, what do you think about them teaming up together? Uh, I mean, I think it's just putting an exponent on a shit. Like and your exponent shits. You're, you're still, yeah, you're still gonna end up with shit. It'll just be twice as much shit, you know? Oh, uh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Like if okay, so like there was like an article. Uh, I think it's a Rolling Stone article, or maybe it was this one. It was talking about like how um, both of them have faced racist attacks and comments, and so like if they the entire ticket, if like both of them are like running on the same like ticket as like one's VP, one's Prez, like. Now it's like not just go back to your own country. It's y'all go back to your country. You know, like yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, the reason I ask that is because like they're already getting shit on 
independently, right? Like Ann Coulter, she is that re- like white woman Republican talking coach. She yeah, literally yeah, told scarecrow. Nikki that already. Yeah, the, the, the scarecrow. She literally told Nikki to you know go back to your own you know country already. And every Christian pastor network is already shitting on Vivek for being like Indian and Hindu and having many gods. So right. I feel like. I feel like they might as well team up, right? Because otherwise they're shitting on each other when other people are already shitting on them. Mm, Yeah, I don't, I I agree, but I don't think they're going to figure that one out. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I don't think they're going to figure that out. Which it's also like kind of wild that a a bunch of like pastors are shitting on Vivek and him being Hindu because I've heard some of his talking points about religion and that dude sounds like a Sunday school teacher. Like he's, he says stuff like, <laughs> you know, America started going downhill as soon as like we took prayer out of schools or something like that. And I'm just like, but it's not like they would do Hindu prayers. Like what is this yeah. guy on? <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's, it's going back to that talk about Hindu nationalism versus Christian nationalism. Yeah, he's trying he's, to bring it all together. He's smart. I'll give it that. He like, even though he's not Christian, he at least reads the Bible, right? Which I feel like might be more than many Christians. Whoa, he's so he's, he's doing the extra the extra homework. He's doing the extra credit. Yeah, yeah. for real, for real. It's kind of funny. Oh uh, man, yeah. I maybe the actual last thought is I still do think it's great to have two of them, just because I think Andrew Yang was such a you know having one person was really hard, and you know people had back and forth. But now you have two, and you can really compare them against each other. Yeah, both equally clowns, though. <laughs> yeah, both equally clowns in different ways. Yeah. 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 Cool. Hey, if you're still listening to this podcast, please consider pausing and giving us a five star review on whatever app you're listening on, whether that's Spotify, Apple Podcasts. I don't think anyone else does it. Uh, if you really like the episode, consider donating to our Buy Me a Coffee. It's a one-time payment of an amount you choose, and we'll take literally anything. You can go to our website or head over to buymeacoffee.com slash political Asian. We're so broke, we couldn't even buy a longer URL with our proper name. Thanks, and now back to the episode. All right. Well, we just talked about one type of clown. Now we're moving on to another one. So we're talking about uh, police and more specifically the people who watch them. So there's this whole group of people called cop watchers. Many of them are YouTube celebrities. And this article just talks about how their videos, um, their content has really changed how people interact with police on a day-to-day basis. So these are people who... Literally just like they have GoPros, they have cameras, they walk up to cops, they record them, they record the entire interaction. You know, I'm sure you've seen some go viral on TikTok or wherever because that's their whole point. Um, And it's actually led to a lot of progress, I'd say. Like there are many cops who've gotten suspended, disciplinary action, sometimes fired. But this entire piece is just talking about that entire community. Jerry, what's one thought you had about this group? It reminds me of a step up from those YouTube videos where people scam back the online scammers. I don't know if you've ever seen those. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. But it's like (laughs) finally the first good influencer. Like, this is praxis. I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) This is what they mean when they say that. Like, I don't care if Mr. Beast donates eye surgeries to a thousand people. I feel like this is more important because, you know, we were talking about earlier about getting the bodies for for organizers they're they're like literally putting their bodies out there um and doing it themselves yeah literally (laughs) just just imagine traveling back in time and you go to meet Karl marx and you show Karl marx (laughs) this specific video of a cop watcher this this is you you did this you thank you This is the praxis you talk about. <laughs> I don't think he'd be too pleased to know that these yeah. guys are like can make up to one hundred fifty thousand a month, though. Oh yeah, yeah, they are pretty rich. Yeah, but I mean, they're they're individual. Um, I don't know, like individual content creators, right? They're they're owning their own production for. Real. That's yeah. true. That's true. Yeah, they are their they are their own labor. They're a one person, two person team. Yeah. But I mean, on that note, you're right. A lot of them are making like bank, as in some. You know, the number is sometimes $150,000 a month. I'm like, oh, my God, you're right. Every kid should become a content influencer, and then more of them might also try to become cop watchers. There you go. Yeah. Less, less prank videos, more cop watching. 
Yeah, literally, literally. But it, it's really effective because, well, let me ask you this. If you were approached by a cop and they asked you to for some ID, like, would you know what to say? I would probably ask uh, what crime I'm being accused of or, um, like, you know, like, why, with the grounds for arrest. Because I think you only have to show ID if you're being arrested. Oh, okay. That, that's think. better than... I think. Yeah. <laughs> like, I think that's what you do now, too, after watching these videos. But, um, yeah, they're essentially, like, there are many states where you don't have to show ID. You can ask them, am I being detained? Am I under arrest? Yeah. Am I free to go? Because before watching those cop watcher videos, like I watched like a few of them before watching those, I would literally have been like, "Oh shit, my name's Aaron." <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> wait, wait, but you would have just you would have just told them you would have been my my name's Aaron, and like no way to back that up <laughs> for them. Yeah, literally. Yeah, I would say like my name's Aaron. Yeah, I'm like it, it's really intense in the moment, right? Wait, wait, Unless no, you no, no. let's let's go back. What's crazy okay. is that you could lie to the cop. You don't have to tell him your name. You know that, right? Yeah, I'm Vivek Ramaswamy. <laughs> there you go, perfect. <laughs> yeah, that's um, yeah. I think watching those videos is really helpful for knowing like what to say. But also, I'm like really impressed that people have actually been getting suspended about that. You know, parts of the article were talking about how every time a video goes viral, the cops like office, the department just gets a whole bunch of phone calls and voicemails too. Yeah. I, like yeah. they, they said like death threats and stuff, and I was like, mm, yeah. <laughs> I don't, yeah. I don't know if I feel bad because it's not like you know these people know, you know, it's just yeah. you're the cops, so you wouldn't you guys be the ones that handle that anyway? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it also has been decreasing morale among police, and I'm also like, cool, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I guess most, you know, maybe like the best thing is just that it really is kind of making departments i'd say like police themselves a little bit in terms of like whoa you can't randomly harass these people anymore otherwise we're gonna end up on like tmz and youtube <laughs> and then we're gonna get a whole bunch of shit so it is kind of putting them in line when they try to abuse first amendment rights yeah i think it's also wild because um you know the article talks about how uh republicans are supporting measures to limit recording when it comes yeah. to these interactions and it's just like so much for free speech snowflakes like what yeah. happened <laughs> yeah literally yeah um only like a lot of them have been overturned because they're trying really i guess like unconstitutional stuff like oh you can't record within 25 feet and then it just gets struck down but it, it it's kind of it it's kind of funny. Yeah. Also wait 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 if there's anything we learned from covid it's that cops have no sense of like how much distance is in feet? Uh, you yeah, know what I mean? Like yeah. they ne they never masked, didn't get vaccinated. Like it's clear you guys don't know what six feet is. How much more for twenty five of it? Yeah, literally. Yeah, yeah. It's also hard, right? Because if they're moving, then you have to move. Right. But, yeah, it's such an arbitrary. <laughs> they're, they're very arbitrary rules, and that's what gets struck down. But I do think this. I mean, all this kind of started, you know, back in twenty twenty. I think a lot of people cite the George Floyd murder mm -hmm. and how if it wasn't recorded, no one would have known what happened. Right. And so a lot of them, you know, took up after that to just keep doing this all over. And I think it's good because sometimes police, they turn off their body cam footage. And so it's like, if you don't have that, then all you have is yourself. Yeah. I thought that was really wild. And they were, they talked about this, um, uh, story of one of the they're also called auditors which i think is like <laughs> yeah. i think that's way cooler than content creator you know what i mean yeah. content creator yeah. influencer fuck that call me an auditor that's fucking yeah. sick man i sound yeah. i got a notary pad i got anyway they talked about one of these auditors and um you know they were kind of there's apparently like a debate in this this community about um antagonizing the cops versus mm. just kind of like being silent and you know quiet and that kind of thing um when recording and one of them was talking and he he was like he's not capable of biting his tongue when his rights are being violated um and i was like man when you put it like that <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i guess like i'm not really capable of that either <laughs> yeah literally yeah but i i yeah. oh go ahead I was just going to say, um, it was, he, he talks more about his story and like for him, what inspired him to start doing this was that he had a confrontation where he was arrested, but he didn't identify himself to his, 
the people who were arresting him. So the cops, like, I guess went through his phone or something, found his girlfriend, and pressured her to reveal his name. So, yeah, I would probably feel the same. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is specifically the one guy Long Island audits, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. In New York, yeah. I was like, yo, it's a great place to be for a cop presence, right? NYPD. Um, I'm like, damn, have I passed this guy before? Like, Maybe. where is he? Like, yeah. It's, Invite it's, him to the picket line. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But yeah, like, I feel like New York is such a great place to do this, right? Biggest budget, you know, NYPD everywhere. Right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm not gonna lie. This, this is, this is praxis. Like, this is, this is really cool to see people actually challenging uh, police in this way and just having, you know, uh, what do they call that? Like the public jury decide things. Mm, yeah. The, yeah. The court of public opinion is, yeah, I think, court the of fancier public opinion. term. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> public jury. The court of public opinion, because before this, we only had like no footage or cops planting, you know, little packets of weed everywhere or their own body cam footage that they turn on and off sometimes. Right. Yeah. I think there's like um, one piece of opposition against these auditors is like, oh, the police claim that these auditors are like, doctoring the footage to make them look bad but then like the article talks about how there's like even some auditors that will supplement their own content with like police body camera footage that they get oh, through yeah. <laughs> public records yeah. so i just think yeah i think you know it's not cops do enough on their own to look bad it's no no one exactly. else is doing that i agree that, yeah it's a lot of the footage is pretty continuous as well so it's not like random jumps right i'm like uh, you know show me the doctor footage i'm like most of it looks you know it's it's very straightforward like a continuous like 30 minute vid <laughs> all right well moving on to our our next topic we're talking about my favorite fast food chain which i guess after this story is no longer my favorite but <laughs> it's about Jollibee. And for those of you who have never experienced the joy of eating Jollibee, uh, Jollibee is basically like the Filipino McDonald's, except if McDonald's also offered fried chicken and spaghetti. Um, the, du <laughs> the duality of man. Um, and in Jersey City, New Jersey, nine employees organized a protest against the restaurant that they worked at because... Um, they alleged that they were fired illegally. They made some demands like being, you know, reinstated, back pay, and a public apology because all they did was ask for holiday pay and a $3 wage increase. And they believe that's what got them fired. Now, Jollibee is like, no, it was because of money. But, you know, a lot of people are saying that's not true. Um, I will stop there. Aaron, what are your thoughts on all this? Yeah, my first thought, you know, like you said, not so jolly anymore. We, <laughs> we're sad to be over here. I mean, I, I like covering this because it's, you know, a lot of this pod, we do talk about, uh, like, not all skin folk are kin folk. That's saying, yeah, this is one example of like Filipinos exploiting Filipinos because like the managers at that Jollibee were also Filipino. Yeah. You know, they were the ones in charge of the firing, silencing them when they tried to organize for higher wages. So really, there is that strong class dynamic with very much Asian on Asian economic exploitation. Um, yeah, that's it. just Filipinos, exploiting Filipinos. I never really saw an example like that before, but now I'm like, in America. okay, it's in America. In America, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> in America. I've really seen that before. Uh, that, that's my first thought. Yeah, um, damn, that's like a much better first thought than I had. I was just going to say, like, <laughs> I have no problem boycotting the Journal Square Jollibee, but now if the Jollibee in Woodside comes out with similar accusations, I will actually spiral into depression because that's the yeah. only one I know that, like, sells Yum Burgers. Um, and for me, Jollibee isn't even that good. It's just that it reminds me of being in the Philippines. So, like, paying uh, for, like, a, a $10, like, a Jolly Meal or whatever the fuck it's called is a lot a cheaper. Jolly Meal? <laughs> is a lot cheaper than a, um, a plane ticket to the Philippines. <laughs> wow, they really took a lot of inspo from McDonald's with that one. I, I, yeah. I'm sure it's not called a Jolly Meal. It's just been oh, a minute since okay. I've... But, like, I do know that when you order it, they, they say, like, have a Jolly Day or something like that. Oh, uh, yeah. okay, yeah. No one says have a, I guess, happy day at McDonald's or... No, or no McDonald's. one's happy at McDonald's. <laughs> no, no, but, 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 but. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the people who were fired also mentioned that 
there are many other Jollibee stores where this type of wage theft and exploitation is also happening. Um, you know, because they, they filed a case with the National Labor Relations Board. And in that claim, uh, they said, yeah, there are cases of mistreatment, misclassification of workers, and chronic understaffing of Jollibees all over the world. So I was like, oh, this is a movement. This is the beehive, you know, <laughs> the Jollibee yeah. hive. <laughs> yeah. Um, but also it's like, uh, I thought this was good to cover because wage theft is the most untalked about form of theft. Uh, even though it's like the most um, the most amount of theft in terms of dollars. Oh, I see. Like, yeah, like if you just Google like this, it's like this really infamous like square graph where it's like the amount of wage theft per year versus larceny, burglary, and auto theft. And it's like wage theft adds up to like almost like fifty mil a year, but larceny, burglary, and auto theft add up to about like ten or fifteen. Oh, sorry, mm. bill per year. It's yeah, I was fifty say, billion like 50 per year. Mil? Yeah. <laughs> 50 billion versus like 15 billion. So wage theft happens everywhere. It's very untalked about, very underrated, even though it's the biggest slice of the pie. And it just happens in cases like this, right? Like you don't get overtime. You're classified as independent contractor. You know, you don't get tips. It's it's all this little stuff that just adds up a lot. I feel like that dem- that statistic must be the case because it's it's – like wage theft is hidden in like a bunch of loopholes, legal jargon, or just like, you know, um, white collar crime kind of. Yeah, exactly. And, and then like larceny and like, like theft and all that stuff is like a lot easier to visualize because it's like, oh, you stole my ten million dollar diamond necklace. That's yeah. a lot of money. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and I feel like that's why a lot of uh, Republicans always go to that. Hmm. I mean, you know, whether you're like an Asian Republican, white Republican, black Republican, like everyone always points to like, oh, look at the Black Lives Matters protested who destroyed this like, you know, oh. 500. I don't know how how much money it cost to replace the glass at Target. But like, they're like, oh, they destroyed this shop. Right. And, it, and it's, you know, they, they point to the visuals. But it's like, dude, like the amount of money being stolen from workers is way more than that. Right. Or yeah. like the money made from like slavery and all, all that stuff, which is like, I think yeah. what they were trying to discuss back in 2020 um during yeah. that time yeah that's exactly yeah yeah it's just it, it's so subtle it's not so it's just uh it's persistent right like every single check you're getting like 30 percent of it stolen you're getting your tips stolen overtime stolen it's just it adds up over and over again right which is like why i think like in regards you know jolly b claimed that these layoffs were necessary due to quote financial difficulties like how can you be having financial difficulties if you're stealing from your workers you know yeah. also like <laughs> yeah. you i doubt you're having financial difficulties because you're close to like jersey city and yeah. there's so many filipinos in jersey city like i know you guys are raking in money yeah, they also mentioned that they the workers who were fired mentioned that they had Jollibee had rehired people already. Oh. So I'm like, well, clearly you have enough money to rehire after you lose them. So, mm. you know, what's that about? I, I, yeah, exactly. <laughs> what's, <laughs> what's that about? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but the video is cool. Like if you just there, there are more articles about it. You know, shout out to Next Shark for also covering it. Oh, Next Shark, I always think you don't cover political stuff. And then you do this. And I'm like, OK. Okay, we're we're making a little bit of progress right here, but the video is cool. You, they all just said hi to the workers, and then they just read out these statements, and then the police were also called on them again. Jeez. And yeah, it's wild because I know one of the workers who, or I guess former workers who's like leading the charge or whatever, is like 19 years old. Like that's oh yeah, very very yeah. young. Yeah, yeah, it's good Gen Z, but yeah. Yeah, Vince. Yeah, I see Vincent Cruz, a 19-year-old former fry cook, encourages former colleagues to be brave and take action. That's really cool. Yeah, hero. Yeah. I feel like it's all going to come down to what the National Labor Relations Board says, because mm-hmm. if it's true, that's good. Like that that board is huge, right? They help with like Starbucks, Amazon, etc. I just feel like I know some like older Filipinos that are going to be upset about this. Like if the labor board like rules in favor of the workers because they're going to be like oh like Jollibee's going to pull out of america because it's too expensive quote oh. too expensive <laughs> to run a business here yeah no, no the, the catastrophizing right yeah that's that's yeah that is uh what my therapist would call a like cognitive uh, distortion right? <laughs> <laughs> yo relax Jollibee overall is going to be fine jersey city maybe not so much but like your Jollibee in california is going to be okay 
right yeah and i i actually really just hope that other jollybee locations also use this moment because i, I in my mind i saw this more like as a starbucks situation mm. you know jollybee huge chain i'm sure this weight stuff's happening everywhere good moment to ride the momentum oh interesting i compared it more to uber and lyft because of the misclassification piece where uh workers are being are holding like a part-time status despite oh, working yeah. close to full-time shifts so jollybee does yeah. that so uh to avoid granting benefits to staff and things like that uh yeah exactly yeah. exactly yeah they all copy and paste from one each other like the the mega corporations or like the billionaires they're all just like copying each other's tactics yeah and likewise the workers can too um, I guess in terms of accounts, follow Justice for Jolly Bee Workers. It's also a hashtag, you know, hashtag Justice for Jolly Bee Workers. The actual account is just called Jolly Bee Workers, but yeah, it's yeah, it's, it's really cool. The Beehive. The, I don't know. I don't know what they call. It. Like, is there a term for the groups of Jolly Bee lovers united or something? Uh, the Jolly Bee Hive is what. I, 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 oh, uh, of Jolly Bee. I don't know. I don't know. I. I. It's been a minute. I'm not sure if there's uh, okay. any any term for for that. <laughs> mm, okay. Okay. Cool. Well, let's move on to the final piece we have today. So. We're talking about a very famous nonprofit. It's called the Center for Countering Digital Hate, CCDH. Uh, I guess they might be more famous if you're actually on Twitter, but when Twitter was taken over by Elon Musk, this nonprofit was a group that did a lot of research around like hate speech, all sorts of rhetoric that really jumped up after Elon took over and then used that data to help advertisers pull out of Twitter. The center itself is run by Imran Ahmed. He's the CEO. And he's just talking about how he's getting sued by Elon Musk now because he pointed all this out. Uh, that's that's a good starting point. Jerry, what's one thought you had about this situation? It's hilarious that Musk called Ahmed a rat when, one, Elon looks like a rat. He looks more yeah. like a rat. <laughs> and two, there is literally a rodent called a muskrat. Uh, you know yeah. like he, stop pointing fingers man you're the rat uh, elon musk rat yeah <laughs> that's funny so maybe yeah, it's dude. a compliment <laughs> yeah elon's style is very much try to insult people you know when they try to critique what he's doing um i think most famously was when there was that one like british submarine diver trying to rescue the the thai oh yeah kids who were stuck in the cave he like hired a private investigator then started calling him a pedophile yeah i don't even just think that was like founded yeah just because the guy insulted must submarine which he ended up not even deploying so it's like <laughs> yeah i feel like you deserve to get roasted yeah but yeah, some of the findings that the center found, which I'm sure we can kind of see, is that Musk reinstated a lot of white supremacists, a lot of QAnon supporters, um, that, you know, as, as well as what many people consider like far right extremists. And he also loosened role, uh, rules about what can be said. You know, it's like what is considered white supremacy, what's considered a slur. So, all really bad stuff. And I'm like, thank God someone is actually doing the work that uh needs to be done to hold these like twitter accountable yeah i mean you know suing an organization because they posted facts Ooh, big yeah. brain play <laughs> from the leader yeah. of free speech <laughs> yeah literally. that's a funny thing free speech absolutist until but, but not free speech involving me right <laughs> <laughs> that's basically yeah but i mean i'm i'm glad that the nonprofit's doing things but they're also doing things to um essentially get government to act right because you know like when we see like the facebook trial or the tiktok trial or whatever we realize that like our government is full of these old dusty heads who have no conception of tech policy and so we're just left at the whim of the actual companies yeah i'm su I, I am always surprised that like twitter has not made it to to um testify yet yeah 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 i yeah i guess what facebook's gone through it Facebook and TikTok, but like TikTok it is in a lineup, through. in a lineup. If yeah. you if you took all the social media platforms and put them in a lineup and then like, you know, you you took someone who didn't like really read the news and was like, which one of these platforms based on like your interactions on said platforms do you think would be <laughs> would have to testify at Congress? For me, it would be Twitter, 100% Twitter uh, every yeah. time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, Twitter or yeah, Twitter, Facebook for sure. Just like the it's, I think it's like uh, they're both places where you can lie really easily, mm-hmm. and they go unchecked. Yeah, but it's, I feel like the only way to actually decide this is to literally have that boxing match between Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg. That's yeah. <laughs> I, I, reading about yeah, that? I mean, okay, who do you who do you think's gonna like? Not to get you know sidetracked, but who do you think's gonna win in that? Uh, Mark purely because he's younger. Oh, that's good. Yeah, I was gonna say it's because he's a robot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he has the Terminator reflexes. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. Robot person fights lizard man. I think yeah. the robot's gonna <laughs> yeah. win. I don't. Yeah. But you know, I, I did watch that movie, like that episode of Godzilla, where Godzilla does defeat the metal version of oh, him. Oh, Mecha Godzilla. Right. Yeah. So you never know. <laughs> you never know. Yeah. Oh my God, Mark Zuckerberg is gonna have like frame perfect responses, <laughs> <laughs> just like frame perfect blocks. <laughs> oh man, but yeah, I mean, it's it's really sad because government should be doing something, and it took this nonprofit to publish a lot of reports before Facebook and TikTok started acting. So I think it does show their influence. But mm. like one really famous guy was a uh, like Robert F Kennedy Jr. You know. The apple fell pretty far from the tree in this case. Like he's, you know, he's running for president. He's uh, like very far right. I say essentially, he was linking five G to COVID. Uh, he was Whoa. talking about how vaccines killed people. Uh, vaccines leaked to autism. Just t- like tons of stuff. And he finally got banned after they put. Po- he was on this list called disinformation dozen by the nonprofit. Oh wow! Yeah. <laughs> I just love the idea of like this nonprofit putting out like a hit list like that. <laughs> Literally, I'm like, but it should be the government doing this. That's the thing. It's like <laughs> the government's still trying to figure out how to log onto Twitter. Literally, and it's like Ron Kim. You know, he he's in New York. He he does a lot of home care agency stuff, but he always complains about how like why are so many nonprofits doing the work that government should be doing? Mm. Um, because sometimes government should be the one doing it. Right? Like if if this nonprofit, this digital hate nonprofit, ever tries to cash in or do something bad you know there's no accountability for it right and so that's where like yeah. government should be doing this shit but they're not mm. yeah just not enough people working for the government not enough resources i think this work's really important um and i know like musk is pissed by this kind of work because the you know the reports the reporting is actually factual and yeah. this impacts Twitter in the only way, literally the only way Twitter makes money, which is through advertisers. Uh, yep. Um, <laughs> Ad revenue. Obviously, Twitter has not been doing well since he took over. I think, you know, I looked up the numbers recently and it's like Twitter is worth just one third of what he bought it at, which mm. seems like, you know, I-, I get a little sad when when I buy a stock and it goes down nine dollars. So, <laughs> yeah. so I can't imagine, you know. Losing like what thirty billion on yeah. on a website. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. I think a lot about that one guy who impersonated a pharma company and said insulin was free. And, oh but yeah, he just bought a blue check mark. Um, so I don't know. I don't. I don't feel bad. Suck it, Twitter. Also, like, I feel like renaming this is this is a digression not related to the CCDH stuff, but like I feel like renaming Twitter as X is worse than when Facebook tried to call themselves Meta. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I refuse to say X. I'm just like, it's just Twitter. It's, it's just Please. Twitter. It's just Twitter. It's just Twitter. Um, yeah. And if Elon is a transphobe, I kind of feel like it seems only right that we dead name the platform and keep oh. calling it Twitter. Like, I don't, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I'm not trying to get my account banned, you know? Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. These... Yeah, I mean these lawsuits are obviously ongoing. It's it's being covered everywhere. I'm like, wow, it's it's this is the first time I think I've seen a lawsuit covered so extensively. Mm-hmm. But I hope they win. I hope they don't get destroyed. Elon Musk has a whole bunch of other lawsuits as well from other Twitter employees. I, I feel like it's like the um, you know to tie to tie it back to Carolyn's fortune, the intersectionality of different lawsuits. <laughs> <laughs> it's just where we all hate Elon Musk. We're all trying to take him down one lawsuit at a time. The universe is conspiring to bring us together to defeat Elon Musk. I like it. Yeah. That's a good that's <laughs> yeah, a good beautiful. note to end on. Yeah. 
All right. Well, that's it for this episode. If you enjoyed this episode, give us a five-star review on Spotify and or Apple Podcasts. It's free and takes literally a second. You could probably do it before I finish closing out this episode. Otherwise, we are on the social media platforms, Instagram at Politically Asian Podcast, Twitter or X, whatever, at Politic Asian Pod. We're on TikTok. We're on buymeacoffee.com if you want to support us financially and get a fortune cookie. (laughs) Other than that, I think that's it. And until next time, bye. bye!